Well, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our June Catapult webcast. Uh, my name is Chris Dubuque. I'm the Field Technical Services Manager located in our Portland, Oregon office, and I'm going to be hosting and helping out our presenter today. Uh, our presenter is Alex Worsfold. He's an application engineer in our Bellevue, Washington office who has put together a very, very popular presentation. Alex, take it away. All right. Well, thank you very much, Chris. A little bit about myself here. I am a certified SOLIDWORKS professional and expert. Uh, I am a certified instructor and trainer as well. Uh, I've been using SOLIDWORKS since 1998. Uh, I've worked for several VARs over the last 15 years of my career. Uh, and then I've also worked for a company called Benham Group International, uh, which there's a couple of products at the bottom of this slide here. I kind of consider myself a, a sweepy, lofty, curvy surfaces expert. It's what I really enjoy uh, doing, not only in my, uh, my time here at work, but also in my free time. So some of these projects that you see on the side uh, were done on, in my off hours. Uh, I also enjoy doing product renderings. Uh, I've used Keyshot. Uh, long time ago, PhotoView 360, uh, and my focus is mainly on SOLIDWORKS on the CAD side and then also Visualize. So, you know, when it comes to SOLIDWORKS, there's lots of different things uh, that you can do inside of the CAD software, but today we're just going to focus on the design side of SOLIDWORKS. And to demonstrate that, we're going to use this car. There's a lot of curvy, sweepy shapes going on this, in this car, so we're going to talk about kind of the, the setup process uh, and then some of the tips and tricks to create something like this. So for today, we're going to first talk about the general approach, kind of the different methods that I've used to create this car, and hopefully you guys will get some idea of, of you know, how you can use surfaces to create something like this on your own. We'll talk about working with splines kind of the, the ins and outs, uh, what you should and shouldn't do when creating these kinds of shapes. We'll talk about lofts and boundaries and how they're similar but different. We'll also talk about uh, fill surfaces and how they can help you out in some kind of tricky situations. And then we'll also talk about uh, top-down modeling. Uh, in this specific example, how I've used it to create different components of this car that are all related back to the original uh, component. So let's first talk about the, the, the approach here. So, you know, when we're creating these kinds of complex shapes, most of the time I'm creating primary surfaces. In other words, you know, major surface areas of the car, like maybe the roof, uh, and I can trim those back Later, I, create, I make those surfaces bigger than they need to be, and then they are cut back to you know just the areas that I need. Uh, and then also with that, I use those surfaces to create transitions or define kind of boundaries uh, between uh, edges or or faces. So in the example here, I use the start with the roof. That roof leads to the side. And the back, I use the edges from those from that original surface to help me create those. Once I have the edge of the window line there, then I can start to create the the lower half of that surface. And then that leads into more trimming and more blending uh, to kind of get to that that final shape. So let's take a little bit more in depth look at what it takes to do this. So most of the time when I create this type of of model, I start with profiles. And then there you can see that top surface is actually, you know, directly blended into, into those curves. Now for this top surface here, I started with this, this boundary surface. Whenever you're creating symmetrical models, you want to make sure to keep the, any profiles that are in the middle, make them normal to profile. So that normal to profile is going to give you the ability to mirror that to the opposite side. We'll talk more about boundary surfaces later. But the idea here is you can see I've created a surface bigger than what I need, and then I'm trimming away the edges that I don't need. So I trim away the side, and then the front of the window, and then the back of the surface. And then from here, that leads into the side and rear profiles. 
So for the sides, I'm creating a projected curve that's directly related to both the side. So this is the, the top curve here, and then the side curve here. That creates a projected curve at the bottom of the windowsill. And then I'm also using another boundary surface with just one profile in the middle to kind of give it a little bit of depth inside of that. So that curve right there. So it gives it just a little bit of a, a curve so it's not flat through that transition. But you can see that I'm using the edges of that original surface to define the boundaries of this new face. Now, once I've got that created, I needed to extend it so that I can attach the rear surface and have it follow through that transition a little bit further. So once I'm done with that, I trim that surface back to the lower edge of the, of the body again. And then I, again, I can extend the rear hatch um, a little bit further down where it needs to go. And again, this leads into the side curves. Again, another boundary surface here with two projected curves, one for the, the upper edge of the fender and then the side edge of the fender. Again, this is a boundary surface where we've got uh, just two profile curves, but three, three curves that give it direction and give it a little bit of a, a curve from top to bottom. And then that leads into the lower half of the surface. Again, two more projected curves, this time with one in the middle, one at the bottom. And then the boundary surface is simply just going through three profiles to create that surface. So a few different methods there to create boundaries. And again, we'll talk about how these uh, fit in later on. So creating those uh, primary surfaces, uh, you know, making them bigger than they need to be, you can always trim away surfaces later. Um, and then you use those to create your transitions and create your boundaries around uh, the different faces that you're trying to create. And then for smooth shapes, uh, inside of both boundary and loft, I'm using a, um, a constraint called tangency or curvature continuous. So let's take a look at that. So with the front of the fender here, we need to create uh, a blend from where the fender ends and the headlight begins and the front of the car uh, uh, gets created as well. So you can see I start with surfaces that are bigger than they need to be. I can trim those back and then create some blends uh, up to those surfaces or up to those edges. And then when everything's uh, finished, I can knit those together into one complete body. So we'll step back in time here. You can see I've got everything nested in the nice little folders here that keeps everything organized so I can find it quickly when I need to. So this is where we started. And from here, I can trim away what I know that I'm not going to need. So at some point in here, I need to create a, 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 a new curve that's going to meet up to where the headlights begin. So surface 18 here, boundary surface 18, is where we create that transition up to the headlight. So this curve right here is just part of a circle. And that's actually the base of the headlight. Now, if I show the side profile here, and it looks like my everything's uh, hidden there. So we can turn that back on. And let's look at the side here. So you can see that, that the, the headlight bucket or the, the trim ring around the headlight is gonna match up to uh, that circle. So that circle right here uh, matches the position of where that headlight ends, and then can create that blend up to it. Now inside the boundary surface, uh, you know, we wanna make sure that it is tangent to the existing fender. So you can see I'm using tangency to face here. So the, the edge of the surface is tangent, and then each of the three profiles that are in direction two, each one of these curves are also tangent to those faces, to those surfaces. So let's take a look at that. So for those, I use a 3D sketch. And that 3D sketch on the end constraints are 
equal to curvature. So that's what's going to allow that blend to happen between uh, the, the edge of the fender and the new surface leading up to the headlight. So each, three, each one of these curves has an equal curvature relationship. And you do that just by selecting the, let me pause it for a second here. So you select the edge of the surface, the surface itself, and the end of the spline in order to create that transition, or to create that constraint. So these, these equal curvature constraints, that's how you create those. All right, so that leads into a few more blends at the bottom here. So now I know where the, the end of that, that headlight uh, is going to be uh, transitioning to, and this is going to end up being the leading edge of my fender. And then this edge here is actually the edge of the wheel well. So that lines up to the to the, the the lines that we can see in the, the in the back of the blueprint. But each one of these surfaces here are all tangent to the to the adjacent faces. So you can see I've got curvature continuous here, curvature continuous here to this edge, and then a contact because I, we just need the surface to flow through this edge. This tool is called a surface fill. We'll talk more about this later and why it's important to use these type of features in this specific situation. So just showing a nice blended transition there with the mesh preview and the zebra stripes. And I think we can move on from here. So the next section here, we're going to talk about splines and how um, we really need to kind of uh, not add too much detail when we're working with these type of shapes. So if we kind of look at two different examples here, one with uh, you know just a few points, and then one with many points, you know, kind of think in your mind which one do you think would be better, and um, you know, maybe place it in the comments section there if you think maybe the left or the right one would be better. And, uh, you know, maybe we can talk about that uh, maybe after the, uh, after the session is over here. But the reality is that the one on the left is really the, the, the surface or, the, or the, the spline that we would want to use because this surface or this spline creates a much smoother transition. By adding more points in here, you're adding more opportunity for, for error and deviation. And that's reflected in what's called a curvature comb. So that's this, this uh, edge that's, that's showed up here. And the bumpier this is, the more undulated the surface will become when we actually use it to create a surface. So let's take a look at an, an example of that. So, you know, given these two splines, if we were to create, you know, if we were to kind of overlap them with one another, we can see that they're pretty much the same shape. But if we actually use this for something like an extrusion, uh, and actually, so here's, this is how we can, can look at that, uh, that information in that curve. So if we right click on the spline, we can show curvature of those, of those splines. And there's also a couple of other tools that we can use, which we'll, we'll cover here in a second. But you can see that the, the one with the points is, is not very smooth at all. So let's go ahead and actually use this for, um, for a surface. So I'm just going to reorient this a little bit, and then we'll use that for an extrusion. So I've already done the extrusion here, but you can see kind of at first glance, they, they look very similar to one another. So, you know, if I wasn't paying attention to the details, you know, you might use one or the other. But the devil is really in the, the, the contour or the, or the smoothness of the surface. And by turning on a tool called Zebra Stripes, and if you missed that, that's under the View menu. But Zebra Stripes is really showing the, the underlying 
uh, geometry that's happening here. And it's amplified even more if we were to make this a curved space. So you can re really see here that there are some, some jagged edges uh, in this reflection that's going on. Um, so if we were using this for a fender or, or uh, you know, a smooth, smooth body, um, you know, we would see this in, in manufacturing most likely. So creating uh, simplified versions of splines um, are really going to make things as smooth as, as possible. Now, when you're creating splines, um, you really just want to capture the high points and the low points. So when we're going to we want to create this shape here, we just want to capture the high point and the low point. And again, you know, there's another point here somewhere, another point here, high point here, and then low point here. So when we start to sketch this out, again, I'm just going to capture a low point and then a high point, low point, another kind of transition somewhere through here. I'm not exactly sure where it's going to need to be. Another high point here. Looks like it might change a little bit of a direction here, so I'll add a point there, and then one more for the end. And you can see it doesn't exactly match up. So we need to modify this slightly. Now, we don't want to add any more points. Again, we, we just want to massage this into place a little bit. So to do that, we're using um, what's called a, a spline polygon or a um, uh, a polygon curve. And these options are enabled here under the system. So these four that I'm pointing at here, so tangency, spline control, ghosted image on drag, I use these all the time. They're always on. So with that polygon, it makes it much easier to position the sketch for two reasons. Number one, um, actually the a couple of other tools here before we talk about that, but we can we can insert points. We can um, uh, show something called an inflection point if it changes direction. We can also show minimum radius of curvature, and then also the curvature combs, and we can adjust the scaling of that along with the density. So. To massage this into place, if we use these polygons, um, it does a couple of things. So number one, when, you, when you're using those polygons, you're, you're not adding any kind of re relationship to it, so you don't have to worry about accidentally attaching it to something. Um, also, at the ends of these splines, there's a, a curvature handle or a transition handle. You can modify that or delete it. So I deleted the end after I've changed it here. Now, I don't want to use the, the control points here which they can also be deleted if I need to, but I can. I mainly want to use these polygon points in order to massage it into place because it makes it a much much easier to do that. And um, you can see it actually adjusts the adjacent points for each uh, curve on the point, or for each curve or each point on the spline. And you can see through this section right through here, it doesn't quite match up. So maybe I need to add another point. So I'm going to insert a spline point somewhere about here. Again, I can use the control polygon to kind of massage it into place. And what I'm really looking for on the uh, curvature comb is a nice, smooth transition. I don't want to see too many sharp edges there. Once I'm finished, I can hide that, and then we can use it for something else. Now, we could go ahead and go through the rest of this here, but I think you guys get the idea. We really just want to capture the high points. Um, you know, this one here is a little tricky because it's kind of a, uh, a decreasing radius uh, as it goes around. So I'm really just kind of making those points equally spaced there. And then again, once I'm finished adding those points, I want to use these control points to massage it into place. All right, so I think that's enough on splines. 
the idea here is to keep them as simple as possible. We don't need to add more points um, than we need to. Capture the highs and the lows of the shape that you're trying to create. Make changes using those, uh, uh, those control polygons and the curvature handles at the ends. And you can add and remove points as needed. So you can right click on the spline to add points. And if you need to remove points, you just click on the individual point and then delete it with the delete key. Now, for me, I've changed some colors, some system colors. So this is a system option under colors. So this section here, temporary graphics and shaded, uh, I, it's usually a, a very light yellow color by default, which is hard to see on most monitors. So I like it, this orange color, which matches the CATI colors here. So I use that for my temporary graphics. And then again, those four options that we showed under the sketch. So enable tangency and curvature handles. That way they, they just show up by default. You don't have to turn them on every time you want to change it. Um, the control polygon by default, ghosted image on drag. This is helpful if you're trying to move a spline around and um, kind of see where it was as you're moving it around to give you an idea for where you're gonna end up. And then the, uh, the bounding curve, so that was uh, back here on, on the curves here. So the bounding curve is this line that shows up in the end of the curvature cones. Uh, if that's turned off, then all you would see is just the lines that poke out. So this makes it easier to, to judge how curvy it actually is. Now the splines that I showed earlier, um, up until about 2014, we only had what were called B splines. Um, you, you know, they had uh, points and handles and uh, used uh, control polygons uh, to, to morph those around. And they also had the ability to uh, change the, the direction and vectors uh, at each point. So here you can see I've got a, a curvature handle that is turned on for each individual point. So we would be able, be able to move this around, um, you know, at this point. But really these types of splines are best for really complex shapes where you need a lot of changes in transition and, uh, you know, sections in between points. You can really kind of uh, stretch and, and, and morph it into the, you know, some really complex bends and, and curves. But like I said, in 2014, they introduced um, a new type of spline called a, a Bezier curve. And these are a one singular span. And what I mean by a span is, you know, on a, on a B spline, one span is from endpoint to control point. So that would be considered one span. On a Bezier curve, I only have one complete span all the way from end to end. And it uses some internal calculations to kind of bend that along a, uh, a polygon. So the difference between the two, uh, you know, B splines, I can't add any constraints to that control polygon, whereas a Bezier curve is the opposite of that. So I can actually add uh, dimensions, you know, the length of the control polygon here and the position of that control polygon, I can really control where this point lands with dimensions and relationships, where I can't do that with a B-spline. Uh, we also have the ability to control how tightly the spline matches up to the polygon. So there's a, an option for degree control. I don't have a slide of that, but we can, we can talk about that later, or I can give someone an example if, if they need uh, something later on. But the idea here is, is that you can control how tightly it uh, matches up to those. So these type of splines are really best used for um, smooth shapes, where um, you just need a transition from endpoint to endpoint. Most times when I use these, they're, they're uh, simpler control polygons where I just need to control maybe uh, uh, a quick transition from edge to edge. Um, so that's the busier type curve. So next we're going to take a look at lofts and how they're similar 
and different to boundary surfaces. So similar but different. So if we were to look at each feature side by side, you can see that they look very similar to one another. So in a loft, we've got profiles. Those profiles are the primary way that we influence the shape of that resulting surface. In a boundary, we have two directions. So direction one and direction two, they're not called profiles because in a boundary, each direction has an equal influence over that shape. In a loft, we've got a guide curve. Those guide curves are used to control the edges of the shape, and they can kind of have a wacky influence over the direction of the profiles, and we'll see that here in a second. Lofts also have a unique parameter here called a centerline parameter. And it not only controls the direction uh, that the loft flows, but it also controls the, uh, the uh, angle of the profiles as they transition from profile to profile. So boundaries do not have a centerline path function. They just have directions. With a loft, you can only control the curvature at the start and the end profiles. So you can see that there's a section for that here. We'll talk about that as we get going. And then for boundaries, each profile in direction one and direction two, we have the ability to control the curvature. So if we need to adjust that transition mid, mid profile or mid uh, blend, we have that ability with boundaries. There's also a special ability in boundaries called trim control. So let's take a look at some of these. So we're going to first take a look at a loft. We're just going to do a simple loft between these three sections here. So from profile to profile to profile. At the start and the end, we have the ability here to control the direction. So if I was to go you know, normal to profile, it's going to start perpendicular to that path. We can also control the weight. But we can only do this at the start and the end transition. There is no option for anything in the middle. So that's a loft. Now we'll do a comparison here in a second. But let's uh, delete this and, and let's show uh, how a boundary surface works. So again, very similar. We can go profile to profile to profile. Each one of these profiles can have a direction, just like a loft, but the middle one, we can add a, a, different, a different profile to that as well. So we can apply the same type of weighting here to the start and the end, but here in the middle, if we wanted to adjust you know, the direction that it curves, we can adjust that. So here I'm using normal to profile, so it's gonna be perpendicular to that um, to that curve as it flows through that transition. So very different resulting surface. Now if we look at kind of the comparison between the two here, I've got a side-by-side -side comparison. And by the way, this is using a, a utility called Compare. It's under Tools. So I'm just doing a side-by-side -side comparison here. And you can see that the transition on the boundary surface is very much different than the transition on the loft. So let's take a look at the loft with guides. So again, we'll, we'll do a loft through three profiles, and then we'll use some guide curves here. We'll also use a center line. So I'm going to use a center line here. See, it changes the direction a little bit. But watch what happens as we apply guide curves to the outer edges. It starts to kind of stretch the surface as it goes to the opposite side. So to control that 
better, we would have to add one more guide curve to kind of get it to land where we want it. And I'm not using any kind of constraints or tangencies at the, at the edges right now. This is surely just a loft using profiles and guides. Now, if we look at boundaries, again, very similar example. So we'll go through three profiles here in the middle. And since we don't have a center line, we're just using this profile. Again, similar on the edges. But notice that it doesn't really stretch this side over here by adding the first profile. Because each profile from direction one and direction two have an equal influence from left to right and top to bottom. So this, this surface that it creates is much more relaxed and it's also much smoother. And again, if we were to compare these side by side, we can easily see that difference when we're using zebra stripes. So loft on the right, or sorry, loft on the left and boundary on the right. So in the loft, you can see in this section here, there's, there's quite a bit of um, kind of change in direction that's going on. It's not very smooth here. And also through this section here, there's a little bit more of a rise in the in the curve than you know what should be there. And that that's because the the, the center line for that loft is actually controlling uh, the kind of the direction of the curve as it follows that path. Versus a boundary, it's just trying to maintain a smooth profile across those surfaces. So look at the differences here and here. Boundary is much smoother. So these are better suited for, for smooth transitions. Smaller file size too. So boundaries have a unique ability, which is called a trim. So also notice too that I don't have to use um, an entire profile on the ends in order to create a shape. But in the trim, there's these points. These points can be moved around to trim back the edge. I can't do this kind of thing in a loft that actually have to trim back the, the spline where I want the loft to start and end. If I add another profile here, you see that it maintains the, um, the proportion on the curve automatically. And you can, you can, of course, change this length as well, again, with the trim. So very cool ability on a boundary. So again, the differences there between loft and boundary. Let's also take a look at a fill surface. So fill surfaces are considered a, uh, a, a an end-sided patch, um, meaning that the number of sides is, is variable. We can have as many sides to a surface patch as we need. Um, but really where surface fills are, are used for or, uh, is anything that's, you know, three or five or more, okay? So if it was four, we would want to use maybe a loft or a boundary for something like that. Um, we could use a fill as well, but um, these surfaces really excel for, for these two different scenarios. So um, three, three edges or, or more, than, than, uh, more than four, so five or more. So let's take a look at an example here. So again, remember the transition there um, just below the headlight. So for that, we used a, a surface fill. We've got an edge of the fender, the edge of the headlight, um, the blend where the fender needs to wrap around from the side to the front, and then to the side of the fender. So two of those edges 
two of those edges I want to be tangent. The other two I want it to just come into contact. So for the surface fill, again, you can see that I've got um, curvature on the edges, so curvature on the top, on the side, and then the other edges is just coming into contact. So in a scenario like this, it wouldn't make much sense to use a boundary because I've got an odd number of edges. Let's take a look at one more example. So this is the blend that happens up around um, the transition between the hood and uh, the inner fender and the headlights. It's a little complex here. Again, I've got um, five different edges that it all needs to be um, uh, curvature continuous to, and then the edge of the headlight, it just needs to come into contact. So that creates a nice transition in this blended area here. Underneath the headlight, I had another odd kind of transition here, where I've got five different edges. Most of these, it just needed to be tangent to, but the edge underneath the headlight needed to just come into contact. And then this edge here, it didn't need to be tangent. It just needed to come into contact. So again, nice transition between those uh, five different edges there. There's another interesting transition where I needed a tangent uh, tangency to the all of the boundaries, creating this nice kind of pocket here. So the surface fill does that quite nicely. And then lastly, let's take a look at some top-down modeling techniques. Now, in this example, I needed to create several different parts, so the doors, the hood, the rear hatch. So I'm actually saving some of these bodies into new parts to continue my work on them. So for example, the hood, I don't want to have the ridge in the original component. I want to add that. Uh, in, the, in, a, in a different part later on. I just want to create the, the basic shapes first, and then I can add more detail to those later. And the benefit here is these all stay linked to the original master model. Now, at this point, you can see I've got quite a few features in here. If we look at the performance of this part, I got 403 features. 23 different surfaces, and it takes 42 seconds to rebuild completely. This is starting to get you know, a little bit time consuming to continue working on it at this point in time. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna save this body out into its own individual component. So this part can be saved or inserted into a new part. Now we're not gonna do that right now because I've already done this. We're just gonna switch to it later on. But when we're finished, we would just hide these. We don't need to see them anymore. So that component or that body gets exported and brought into a new body here. So this is linked to the original uh, model. If we go to the references here, we can see that it's still linked to that component and it's linked to one of the bodies within, within that component. And then from here, I would continue designing. I would reinsert my profiles so that uh, any details that I need to reference are still there. And then I just keep, keep making new components. So cutouts for the doors, for the hood, uh, louvers and things like that. And then when I'm finished, I would mirror that. So from this body, the opening for the hood and the doors actually export the components from this model, those surface bodies, to create these components. So the hood, this component is linked to that main shell part. That's out of context right now because I didn't have it open when I did this recording here. But from here, I can create more details. So I've added the edges of the hood, details for the center ridge here,
and then the, the detail for the chrome strip. You can mirror everything over, and then lastly, the, the fine little details there. Same thing with the door. So this came from the main shell body. I inserted my profiles just to make sure that I'm following my guides where I need to. Create the outer edge for the door, the opening for the window, details for the edge strips. And since I'm creating additional bodies here, any one of these bodies in this component could be exported and saved. If I need to create individual components for these, they would all be linked directly to this door model. This door becomes my master mo my master part for any little trim pieces that I need to create. Same thing for the rear hatch of the car. So I create a, an area for the, the license plate to fit into, thicken the door up, add any window trims that I need. And then the rest of the details here. And again, these could be individual parts, but I've added them here just to show some, some context. Now for the roof rack, I need to create a new component, but I, I only want to reference the top of the body. So I've inserted, oops, let me go back here. So I've inserted the just the top surfaces of the body as a reference. Um, they're not going to change, so I've actually I've actually severed this link here. So that's what that X is. And then for the roof rack, I simply sketch out a three-dimensional sketch of the shape. And then I'm using the weldment profiles, just round tubing, in order to create those. I needed some custom transitions where they, they line up to the, the rain gutter here. So I actually cut those tubes back and then use a solid loft up to that the edge of the, of, of the, uh, the rain gutter there. Another weldment profile for the, uh, the wood strip. Some finer details. And there we've got our roof rack. And then when it comes time to create the assembly, I just insert each component at the top level here, and I align them up to the origin. There really are no mates in here. All these components are just fixed in place uh, based on the origin. I just drag and drop them in and I can get a complete model of the car when it's finished there. So again, on the top-down modeling side, so those bodies can be saved out into you know, individual components, and then further detail can be added to, to, to each one of those new components. And the benefit here is that those parts stay linked to the original model, so if you need to go back and make major changes to the design, makes it easy to do that. Helps reduce the load on the PC when you're actually working on those individual components because there's less features to be rebuilt um, as you're modeling. And the result um, is a very smooth surface model. And these were created uh, just out of uh, SOLIDWORKS Visualize here. So very smooth transitions on everything.
So thank you for your time, guys. We've got uh, one more slide coming up here and uh, one more webinar coming up here in July. And I'll let Chris talk about that uh, for this next section here. Perfect. Thank you, Alex. I, mean, I just want to appreciate everyone for – or thank everyone for joining us. I uh, appreciate you guys showing up. Thank you so much for Alex for putting this presentation together. Uh, there we can see towards uh, the end of July we'll have a catapult session on uh, design tables and design reuse. Also take a look at the website. We have new events that get added uh, very, very frequently. So these slides may be a little bit out of date. CATI.com is always the best place to go for this type of information. Uh, so again, thank you to Alex. Thank you to everyone for joining us today. And I hope that everyone has a, a great rest of their day. And I see you in the next webcast in the future.